Um, you also know, if you're in my class, that um, I love food and I love food writing. Um, and I feel very, very honored that we have uh, three top people uh, from the food journalism world to um, talk to us this evening about food, about food writing, about recipes, a little bit maybe about some restaurants that they like. Who knows, you might get some inside skinny on a place to go next time you go to New York. Um, but all sorts of manners about food and food writing. Um, before we get started, um, I just want to say thank you to the magazine department generally and to my uh, chairman, um, Melissa Cheshire, specifically. Unfortunately, she had a commitment this evening and couldn't uh, make it. She'll be here a little bit later uh, in the evening. Um, and uh, Marianne Durantini, who helped out uh, enormously behind the scenes. Couldn't be done without her help. Uh, I just wanted to send a little shout out to her as well. Um, and I gotta tell you, um, every dinner party needs to be well presented. And Stanley does a great job of presenting our stage. And actually, I'm gonna give Stanley, he never, he does this stuff, nobody knows who he is, he's like a ghost. These things just seem to appear. And um, I, just, I, just, I just can't thank him enough for how much he does and how much he relaxes me. It's unbelievable. Um, I also want to thank the students who helped so much behind the scenes as well, May, designing posters, uh, pu putting up posters, uh, doing Facebook, just doing all sorts of those things that there's no possible way I could get this done without their help. And so I want to thank uh, those who helped uh, so much on, on all these events, but especially on this one. Thank you. Um, finally, I want to thank our guests for coming up uh, from New York. They came just about every possible way you can. We had a, you know, we, we always, uh, you know, we fly people up, and, but, you know, we only had one, one person that we flew. Otherwise, we had uh, a train. We had a train over here. We had a car. Uh, the only thing we didn't have, we were not assailed by a boat. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe Lake Onondaga later tonight. Who knows what will end up happening. But, um... So, um, okay, uh, I want to thank the three of you for coming up. I really appreciate it. And I want to do just a very brief introduction of the three of them. And then we'll uh, get into a little bit more about them and a little bit more what they do. And we'll start talking about, um, about uh, food and food writing. Um, directly to my left is uh, Hugh Merwin. And he is the associate editor at Grub Street. Now, most of you may know uh, Grub Street. Um, it's uh, from New York Magazine, and uh, it is a highly successful and very influential um, website about food, food writing, about food and, and um, restaurants, and uh, lots of things having to do with, with the um, inside skinny on food. If you're interested at all about uh, what's going on in the food world, you read Grub Street. Um, Helen Rosner, uh, sitting in the middle, is executive digital editor for Zavour magazine, and she oversees the brand's non-print components, uh, web, tablet, video, social media, special projects. Um, and I have been reading Zavour for a very, 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 very long time. I remember when it first got started. Um, one of the things that I really um, liked when it began and still like today is that Zavour is uh, a bit of an, I guess maybe it's not too much to say, a bit of an antidote to a lot of the shiny um, food um, journalism out there. Uh, it's more of a cultural approach to food, and I really, really like that, and it really engages me on a whole nother level. Um, Adam Sachs um, is, well, I will say what he does now, and then I'm going to say a little bit more. It's editorial director for tastingtable.com, which he just recently started doing a few months ago. But let me just tell you, if any of you out there are interested in food or food writing and you're not reading Adam Sachs, you have done yourself a tremendous disservice. Get out. Um, <laughs> you can stay. Um, maybe he'll argue with me. I don't know. Um, but... Um, his, his, his writing has appeared in all the top magazines, food and otherwise. Uh, he writes terrific long-form stuff, and uh, we are very honored to have Adam and to have Helen and to have Hugh here this evening. So let's have a round of applause for them before we get started. Um, 
Before we fully begin, I do want to um, note that some of the people in here, if you're here, you may be interested in food and food writing um, in a way that you will be familiar with uh, the name Charlie Trotter. Uh, we lost a giant yesterday when he passed away. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with Charlie Trotter, he was a a pioneering chef in Chicago. He put Chicago on the international culinary map. He did a lot of things having to do with food that uh, to this day he was very much a trailblazer. Um, and what I want to do is just take one uh, minute to ask our panelists um, what you think Charlie Trotter's uh, legacy might be. So I'll start with you, Hugh. Um, I think one of the, I, th I think, I mean, other than making really great, Charlie Trotter did so many things. I mean, um, the thing that my introduction to Charlie Trotter it was actually like this, this late foray that he had in the, the late 90s into raw foods, because I was actually experimenting with a raw food diet at the time, and he had written this, co written this great cookbook. Um, but I mean, his accomplishments are like, you know, I think the most important thing that Charlie Trotter did for American food chefs, restaurants, is um, he bridged the, this like sort of European tradition of restaurants and made it more accessible for young American cooks. Uh, specifically, he studied with a chef named Freddy Girardet, um, who is not not a lot of people know about him now, but he was also like another one of these very influential chefs. Um, and I think that the lessons that Charlie Trotter learned there and then put into practice at Trotter's um, changed the way that young cooks learn how to cook in these restaurants. And then all those cooks went on to open other restaurants. And um, I mean, I think that's the legacy. Helen, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Charlie Trotter was in many ways the first chef on a national stage who really considered his diners people who were his audience, um, people who were there to see a form of consumable theater that he was going to provide to them and about which, for better or for worse, he had absolutely no interest in their opinion. Um, he, was, he was a chef who, and I, I think for better, um, you know, he said, I have a vision, I have expertise, I have a palate, um, I have extraordinary experimental groundbreaking thoughts, and you're paying large amounts of money to sit in my dining room and experience them. And, you know, he had a reputation for being a difficult person to work with, to um, buy food from as a diner. Um, but what he really proved, and, and what I think is an extraordinarily valuable lesson, is that um, his product was spectacular. I mean, his food was remarkable. He told stories with food that had not been told before. And um, you can get away with making big demands. You can get away with demanding perfection. He famously talked about firing diners. You know, he said, if, if, you're, if you're not the kind of person I want to have eating here, if you make too many requests, if you ask too many questions, you're out, you don't come back. And that's not polite, but he could do it because what he provided to them was that good. He, he delivered perfection, and so he could demand perfection. Adam, thoughts? Um, I, it's very sad news, obviously. I, I really feel totally unqualified to talk about the man or his food because I've never eaten it at mm -hmm. any of his restaurants or really spent much time with his books. Um, I do think, uh, I mean, my, my real sense of him, in addition to things that I've sort of picked up for that thing, similar to what Hugh and Helen were saying, is that he is thought of as a chef's chef. That mm -hmm. I, I didn't know much about his food, and sometimes it would seem a little bit uh, fussy, or didn't, to me it didn't look super exciting. It didn't seem super exciting. And I would mention that to a couple of chef friends, and they would say, no, 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 you have it all wrong. And this is, you know, they would set me straight. So I know that he's highly, highly regarded by, by chefs of, of, you know, following generations. He's, he was super young, too. I mean, relatively young. He was 54. 54, yeah. so yeah, it's very sad. Yeah. Um, when we talk about somebody like a Charlie Trotter, uh, it gets into a whole other arena of, of food writing, and it's, um, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, and it's going to be about what, how food has taken such a central place in modern life. Um, 
and uh, how it is that you, many of you here, know the names of a variety of chefs. I must tell you, growing up, that was not common back in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. Uh, that's... Um, a relatively new development. And I think it isn't just the chef um, idea, it's also about, uh, it, it gets to an idea of how major a role food generally plays in, in modern life. And so I wanna, because we're on a college campus, I'm going to sort of go a touch off road um, and talk a little bit before we get into chefs and recipes and restaurants and writing and talk a touch about public policy. And um, what I wanna talk about is just, when we read about food, there is so much interest out there right now on some levels on the, um, well, what we might call the food division between the rich and the poor and you all write about food, you write about it in your own ways, but you must come across uh, thoughts and ideas about, you know, that the wealthy can afford to eat organic food and they can afford to eat locally produced organic food. And there are certain audiences that we, um, you know, look at when we look at food. And I'm just wondering, on your radar, what are you seeing in terms of trends having to do with what we might call that? that food division. Um, I guess I'll start again here with, with Hugh. Um, I think that my way into food writing uh, was that I worked in restaurants. Um, and I often actually have a lot of issues with, you know, New York City, there's 4,000 restaurants. Um, a lot of them are very similar. Um, and when I'm doing my job, I'm sort of swimming in this information, and a lot of it gets to be overwhelming um, because I do think about these things, and, and we do cover, on Grub Street, we do cover um, like assistance programs, we do cover uh, the fast food strikes that happened, um, we do cover you know, things that are happening in, in local, organic, and sustainable food. Um, But as far as the divide, you know, it's there. Um, and I'm not really sure. I mean, is there anything that could happen, do you think, in food, or, uh, or, or even as food journalists that we can do to help uh, with that at all? If, if not to help it, to help explain it. Yeah, I mean, I tend to think that that um, getting people interested in food in general, no matter who they are, um, and getting people interested in learning how to cook is always sort of the first step. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's a little bit Michael Pollan-esque, but mm -hmm. like that is the way out. Mm -hmm. um, even if you don't have access to organic food, even if you don't have the funds to, to, mm -hmm. to buy like, you know, hormone and antibiotic free meat, um, even if you're not sure if that's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I tend to go with this sort of like the rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing and, and just sort of celebrating food culture and celebrating cooking, celebrating craft, celebrating technique, celebrating people who are doing something different. Um, I always hope that people who aren't, we cater a lot to the restaurant scene mm -hmm. specifically and, and that's like a, like a sort of like a universe unto itself mm -hmm. in New York City. But um, we're also growing our national audience. So a lot of those people don't really care that you know, some restaurant on 23rd Street has closed. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that in the future, we're, that's the direction that we want to go in. We want to mm -hmm. sort of just want to reach more readers, mm -hmm. but we also want to inspire more people to sort of join the uh, proverbial conversation, I think. Mm -hmm. Do you, Helen, do you have any uh, thoughts about the conversation about food? Uh, um, you know, food is a, eating, not food, eating is a, is a sensory experience. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a physical sensory pleasure. And um, food production and distribution and purchasing is, is political and sociological and has very little to do with the actual visceral joy of putting something that tastes good into your mouth. And um, I think the way that we communicate this important information about 
preventing everything from going completely down the toilet is important. Um, you know, the, the closest analogy I can think of is, is actually with, with sex. I mean, like, you know, it's a sensory experience. It's very intimate. It's not something that um, you want to have sullied by a reminder that, you know, there are diseases and there's inequality and there's terrible stuff happening out there. Um, so I think it's important to, to deliver the message in the right context. Um, you buy a magazine like Sever mm -hmm. because you want to be transported, because you want to be told a story. Um, what we're doing is telling human stories through the lens of food. And occasionally those stories have political <laughs> components to them or sociocultural components to them that are more about policy or more about class. But generally what we're really trying to do is whet your appetite. Mm -hmm. um, I do think though that, that something that we do um, that I'm very proud of and, and that I think addresses this through a somewhat lateral direction is we celebrate all forms of food. Um, you know, I think that the class divide in the American food scene, um, you know, the, the extraordinary kind of luxury of being into restaurants as a hobby, you know, um, it's, a, it's a very real thing and the cost of food is, is rising and, and cheap food is frequently bad food, cheap and easily accessible food. But, you know, something that we do in Sever is we celebrate things across the spectrum, culturally and class-wise. We say, like, it, you can eat incredibly well cheaply and you don't have to eat what is essentially a facsimile of rich people food. Like, you don't have to be eating quinoa and kale for $3.50 a day. You can be eating food that, you know, feels like it's part of your heritage, food that feels like it's part of your culture, whoever you are, wherever you might be coming from, because it can taste good. I think, and I think what Hugh said is, is completely correct. If you're in the kitchen, if you are actually working with the materials, if you know the difference between a chicken thigh and a chicken breast, and you know the difference between cooking a huge, massive GMO chicken breast that's the size of a truck versus like a natural chicken breast, and you taste the difference in that flavor, like it, it just happens, it just happens naturally. The more you know about cooking, the more you are inclined to eat well. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts, Adam? Yeah, I, I agree totally with, with Helen and Hugh that, that this idea that you, I mean, writing about food is on, on one level a very frivolous, ridiculous thing to do. It's the, it's the silliest thing you can do, but it's also in some ways, it's, food is the most profound thing. It's the only thing, it's the only sort of art, if you think of it as an art form you're talking about, um, you know, uh, Charlie Trotter making uh, the US, the American dining scene safe for food as theater. If you think about it as a, as a form of creativity, it's the only thing that we ingest, you know, it's the only thing that we put into our bodies. Um, and how you think about food and how you approach food and the food you eat is is central to your to your being. I, I think the, that divide is also in, in a lot of us. I mean, I'm a walking contradiction. I'm, I'm constantly reading my Twitter feed with Michael Pollan and all these great you know, high thinkers while I'm eating Little Debbie's snack cakes and things and that are just, you know, ter I mean, there's no, it doesn't make any sense. They're really um, good. They are really I good. Like yeah. Little yeah. Debbie yeah. snack cakes, yeah. Um, who doesn't like a Little Debbie snack cake? No. Uh, you don't? You, you don't much care for them? Yeah. No, I have. Oh. Are you a Drake's person? No. <laughs> you just don't like the snack cakes? Huh? Well, okay, good. Things are turning, uh, t turning uh, rocking already um, over the Little Debbie snack cakes. Who knew? Um, so, um, one of the things that you all mentioned in that is being able to cook. Um, uh, we keep hearing, though, that people don't have time anymore to cook. What is your observation about that? You know, you have people working two jobs. You have people, you know, both, both parents working. You have, you know, very limited time. And we're told constantly that people don't have the time anymore to cook. And there's all this, like, sort of fast food. And yet, at the same time, we see a zillion um, cooking sites and recipe sites and whatnot. So help me out here. What's going on? Uh, can people, are people cooking more? Or what, what's your feeling about this? And let's start this time with, with Helen. Um, I think people are cooking more and they're cooking less. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I haven't seen the latest demographic research about how many people are actually in their kitchens at this exact moment. I think interest in cooking is incredibly high. And I think a great deal of food writing and a great deal of recipe writing and, and cookbooks and recipe websites, um, there's a component of fantasy to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very attainable fantasy. You know, you watch a show like, like Barefoot Contessa and you want that life. And... Um, and I think, you know, browsing these websites, you know, it incites a physical response. You get hungry, you see things, you salivate. It's really enjoyable. It's a very accessible pleasure. Um, my completely uninformed, totally off the cuff mm -hmm. guess would be that 
we probably as a, a nation and as a culture have more weekend cooks than we mm -hmm. used to. I think cooking has um, sort of shifted over into the realm of being almost a craft project. Mm -hmm. It's a lot about showing off what you've made, mm -hmm. which I think is a, is a great mm -hmm. thing. I mean, you know, it's, it's not just I made the roast chicken, it's I made the roast chicken and I Instagrammed it and I tweeted it mm -hmm. and I blogged about it and I showed it off to people and I didn't just make it for myself alone in my apartment, I threw a dinner party. It's a performative act. Right. And, um, and that introduces all of these new dimensions that make it way more desirable for people to do because you can get you know, this great positive reinforcement for it, but it also makes it have a much, much higher barrier to entry. It's much more intimidating because you can't just make a roast chicken for yourself anymore. You have to Instagram it and it has to be for a different right. Adam, along those lines, a tasting table. You have to. You have to. There is no other option. You must. And, and along those lines, Adam, do you, um, when the recipes go out uh, yeah. uh, from Tasting Table, and, uh, are you th what should, what, who are you keeping in mind when, you're, when those recipes go out? Are, are these people that you're hoping are going to maybe make that recipe in the evening or hold on to them and do them on the weekend? Or do you have a thought process that goes into that? Yeah, it's a bit of all of that. It depends on the recipe. I mean, some of them are tailored to be you know, to make you want to make it that night or be as easy enough to sort of throw it together and stop at the grocery on the way home and get the, uh, the fixings for it. So, and some of them I think are more, like you said, aspirational, more sort of, I'd like to think that I'm the type of person to make this. Uh, or you want to know the story behind it and, and the recipe is, is part of that story, mm -hmm. seeing mm -hmm. how, how the sausage is made literally is, is you know, part <laughs> of the story. Um, so I think I think it depends on on the I think with, with tasting tables specifically I, I mean it's different I think for the food magazines mm -hmm. print magazines but with us it's it's got to have a story around it so mm -hmm. it's a it's you don't have to go make it that night for it to be hopefully an uh, interesting read yeah um, what do you look for when you look for a story a tasting table. Um, and, and, you know, because we are now starting to drift into the area of online journalism and online writing and online, you yeah. know, food writing. So what do you, what, what sorts of things do you look for? I, I think for me, because I, I, I've been a, a writer for the last, a freelance writer for the last 10 or 11 years and uh, haven't been an editor for a long time. So, and don't come just from a food background. To me, it just, it first and foremost has to be a, a compelling story. So I just want to know something about I don't know, how a dish is made or the background of a chef or a bartender is doing something interesting. So I think as long as it meets the criteria of is, it, is this person or is this thing, is this ingredient, is this you know, cuisine or dish compelling, interesting, fascinating, weird, I think that then it, then it becomes a story. If it's just sort of a great you know, recipe for blueberry pie floating off into space, that may be useful to someone who needs a blueberry pie recipe right now. Mm -hmm. but we're sort of going straight into your inbox and it has to have some sort of context around it. Mm -hmm. um, Hugh, so there's a lot of restaurant stuff on Grub Street. Um, and who's, in, in the end, who's the audience for Grub Street? Um, I mean, that's, that's a great question. <laughs> um, up until recently, we had Grub Streets um, in, in, we had one in Chicago, San Francisco, mm -hmm. Los Angeles, and Boston. and um, we closed down the city sites this year uh, so that GrubStreet.com could be sort of more nationally focused mm -hmm. and, and still keep up with like, you know, chef, restaurant news. Um, but basically, um, if, it's not a, if it's not something that's a national story that, that, uh, that you know, like we have to post on, um, I, sort of like what Adam is saying, like I, I'm looking for compelling stories. Um, and um, basically, if we succeed at telling those, um, then I think the rest sort of works itself out and then it finds its way to the audience, mm -hmm. whoever that audience may be, because it's changing. Mm -hmm. um, Do you think they're uh, young? Uh, is your audience uh, more young than, than, than old? Or what's, you know, what, what's your sense of who's I, reading, who's interested, who? goes every morning to Grub Street. A very good friend of mine, uh, her mom is like 69 or something like that, and she's an avid reader of the site. Mm -hmm. um, and she doesn't really go to a lot of the restaurants that we write about, but yet she keeps up with the stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and she has for many years. Um, so when I hear things like that, I, I, like, I find that, that really interesting. Um, I think that Grub Street used to be a more 
industry focused mm -hmm, mm -hmm. site and a lot of sort of like, you know, such and such partner left like right. such and such a nightclub, mm -hmm. you know, like and a, a lot of uh, a lot of those types of stories, and and we're sort of moving away from that um, into lots of different directions. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it fits with what you were saying about uh, how many people know chefs, and I was just thinking, talking to some of you uh, before this, that when I was in college, I couldn't name, I think, a single chef. Maybe I was just uh, particularly uninformed, but it wasn't like a thing that people knew. And now reading about food is like subscribing to Sports Illustrator or something. Like you don't have to be a huge sports fan to yeah. sort of be sort of passively somewhat interested in it. I was actually talking about it earlier too with, with some folks that, um, that I used to do a sort of the old kind of Grub Street reporting that he was talking about. I would write really intensely about the New York restaurant scene. And it, it essentially was was gossip writing. I mean, it's, it's telling a story. It's not, it, or it wasn't. Um, actually about food. It right. was about personalities and characters. And I think that is what happened with mm -hmm. the chefs. I mean, food is the vehicle. It's their reason for being. But we stay interested in them and their, their people that surround them and build their brands and stuff like that ensure that we remain interested in them because they become characters in a story that we construct, or they construct, and that sites, blogs, Instagram, Twitter, TV shows perpetuate. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that cultural conversation. Um, we, you and I talked a little bit about this last night. Um, that there was a time, um, it, you know, it seems like there are periods in which the culture sort of gravitates one way or another. You know, like in the 30s and 40s, it might if you were a sports writer, a lot of people knew uh, about, uh, you know, top sports writers in America, and many of them became novelists and whatnot. And then, like, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, rock criticism became really popular, and people that wanted to make their name in writing became rock critics. And then blogging came in, and everybody was blogging. And now food seems to be a cultural conversation that is somehow much larger than it has ever been in my memory, um, people do know, 20-year-olds, um, 21-year-olds know the names of many chefs, whereas you and I didn't know the name of a single chef when we were in college. Um, and they know about, uh, and they make choices about whether they want to be a vegetarian or certain policy uh, decisions that just never occurred to us. And now food is a very cold part, very much a part of the cultural conversation. In fact, it could be argued it's driving the cultural conversation. That, um, um, Helen? You ha sorry, yeah. I'm Go ahead. I'm jump yeah. on that. Um, I agree. I think that's definitely happening. But I think that it's happening simultaneously with virtually every other facet of culture also being mm -hmm. much more saturated. It's like all of a sudden the pie has gotten a lot bigger. So people can name chefs, and they might not have been able to do that 15 or 20 years ago, but they can also name fashion designers and architects and um, you know directors, but not just film directors. They can also name producers, and they can also name cinematographers. I think that um, the internet is changing our lives in magical ways. Um, we have access to such extraordinary quantities of information in such detail and with such nuance that um, across all vectors of our life, we can be much more informed and also much more obsessive consumers. Mm -hmm. um, I think food has exploded tremendously, possibly more so than some of those other mm -hmm. examples. Um, Probably because, as Adam was saying, food is the great universal. I mean, food is the thing that everybody does. Right. You think it's just about, I mean, it's always been the universal, though. It feels like something's changed about food in America uh, over the last 20 years. I mean, food TV really did change. We were just putting people like Mario Vitale and Emeril and all mm -hmm. these people, all the early Food Network guys, who became uh, you know, brand names that people who I went to high school with who don't never cared about food mm -hmm. knew they knew the shows. I, I mean, I would notice it when a couple of years ago I posted some pictures from some Beard Awards thing, and, and people f from out of the woodwork who I went to school with who had never expressed any interest in anything food really, who I couldn't get to come with me on reviews, who I would invite for free meals, who had no interest, were like, "Oh, you're standing with uh, you know that is that Marcus Samuelson? You know him?" It was bizarre change in the in the culture somehow. But I do think, it, uh, to Helen's point, I think it is every niche gets to feel like it's in the mainstream a little bit. Mm -hmm. and so it's pr it is while it is bigger than it ever has been in a way as as a as a media thing as a as a sort of uh, cultural thing. It also is probably not as big as 
we think it is when we're, you know. Maybe not, but I'll tell you, if you if you work in magazines and you're looking at magazines, one of the, you know, everybody's talking about, oh, print is dead and magazines are dead, and uh, when in fact they're not. Um, I mean, if you, um, well, if you look at the latest numbers, you'll see that they're that they're actually pretty successful over at least the last year, and what, one of the big growth areas is food journalism. I mean, yeah. Bon Appetit had an enormous year last year, and yeah. a lot of uh, food, ma that, that whole sector is just really exploding beyond any of the other sectors, uh, beyond fashion, certainly beyond entertainment. Um, you know, that sector is huge right now. Well, you get to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the thing is like right. you, you, you can buy Vogue and maybe you can afford to buy half of a pair of pants, you know? But like <laughs> you buy Bon Appetit or you buy Savoir or you buy Food and Wine or, or you buy Esquire and read the food section, you mm -hmm. can go home and make that meal. Right. It, it's not just a magazine that lives in your tote bag or lives in your bathroom, you actually engage with it and then you put it into your body. I mean, it, it, it participates in your life in a way that I think other subjects don't. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts to you about the, where, where food is as a conversation in the culture right now? I, I mean, I just agree with Adam and, and Helen that it's just that, that everything has become sort of outsized and, and um, like more accessible and just I don't know why it's happened you know food tv definitely mm -hmm. um. yeah let me ask a little bit about um the online space that that you guys are in um because we have food writing and then we have you know we have this sort of this I don't know if it's a divide or not, but between print and, and online. And uh, do you look for different things in the online space than you look for if you're writing for print? What's, you know, what's a takeaway from... As a, as a reader? Or as, a, as, a, as a writer, what you look for as an editor to, that you're going to put on your site um, that would, might be uh, either the same or different from what I would put on print. I mean, so, so we put up so much more food content each day than, than, you know, than the magazine puts out in, in the week. And um, the, the editing process for the magazine and going to print is just, it's really beautiful. You know, like they just go over everything so many times and just refine it and just, you know, like distill it to like, you know, if it's a restaurant opening, it's 200 words. Whereas we can, we'll cover the same thing in 1500 words. Um, and we'll do, you know, 18 posts a day. Um, so we have so much more flexibility to... You'll do about 18 posts a day? On a busy day, we'll do 18, yeah. On a busy day? Yeah. How large is the half? Have you all got... Three. The, three people? Yeah. Okay. And so... Um, <laughs> So you've got three people putting out 18 posts a day. Yeah. I see some giggles over here. So what's happening at Savour? What kind of a staff have you got and how many posts are you doing a day? Um, we are not a blog in the same way that Grub Street is a blog. All right. Totally. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we have a, a, a staff of, depending on how you want to count it, um, three, four, six, or eight. And, um, but really kind of four. And we put up uh, probably seven to 10 pieces of content a mm -hmm. day, but that covers all sorts of stuff from single recipes to galleries of recipes to full-length feature stories that originally ran in the print magazine to full-length feature stories that were specially commissioned for web to video. It really kind of runs the gamut. Um, and uh, we actually, at Sever, the print and digital departments are very integrated. We sit together and, you know, I have my own budget and I have my own staff, but we consider the content of the brand as a whole when we talk about content. And the pitches flow very freely from, from my inbox to print editors' inboxes. People pitch me and I forward them onto the magazine and people pitch the magazine and they forward them onto me. Um, there isn't a hard and fast rule of this is a print story mm -hmm. and this is a, a web story. Mm -hmm. I think in general, the pace is faster online. You know, you don't need the three to five month lead time to place a story. I'm still taking pitches for Christmas and the print magazine shipped December a year and a half ago. And, um, and uh, so, so that's great. And I can, you know, be a little bit more topical, but we try not to be too newsy at Sever. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, on the whole, I think we have, a very, we have a very clear voice as a magazine. We know what we like to cover and we know how we like to cover it. And, um, 
you know, like you said, there's just an infinity of space online. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a couple different voices going on <laughs> mm -hmm. at any given time. Oh, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, like we we let writers keep their voices, but yeah, but, yeah. But no, I mean, I think I think there's the analogy frequently that you know, online is a sprint and print is a marathon. But the truth is that online is a sprinting marathon. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really fast forever. Mm -hmm. We've seen a. Uh, a, a lo you know, we've seen lots of long form uh, now on, on, uh, online, um, but we tend not to see an awful lot of long form on food websites. Um, well, you don't see much long form in print these days either, really. I mean, if, if we're honest about it, but Bon App and, and Food and Wine, as, as lovely as they are, have if you're looking at it as a needy writer looking for a way in, there just aren't that many written stories. There are a lot of beautifully produced stories with you know, words spread around them, but in terms of like, <laughs> things with a kind of beginning, middle, and end in paragraphs and, mm -hmm. and scenes, there, just, there, there isn't a whole lot of writing to go, to go around. So we do. You do? All right. Are you hiring? It's a verb? Yeah. <laughs> right. like, uh, <laughs> we'll no, talk we after. Give me my call. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's an interesting. interesting I mean, uh, about all of these things where, you know, you, there is, I think at some magazines there is a bigger divide than others between the, the, mm -hmm. the content and the tone and the quality and the, and the sort of feel of the, of the online face of it and then, as opposed to the print version. And then sometimes it's not. And, and it's a weird thing now where I, find, I do find sometimes when people, maybe I'm, I'm like the old guy who's, you know, new to, <laughs> new to web, some cranky, cranky old print dude. Um, <laughs> But I do sometimes when people say they, they write for you know X magazine, I kind of want to know if they're writing for the you know doing a, a quick right. hit thing for the web or if they've actually gone through the editing process. And that's a fair question, actually. I think you know. So is there a different feel? Do you think then? I mean, like you just said, I want to know if they're doing a quick hit thing for the web. You didn't say a thing for the web, a quick hit thing for the web. So is there a difference in feel between the two, do you think, still? Always. I mean, I think, I think some of the great, you know, some of the great food writing is happening online and some of it is, is not great. And I, I think it, just, it, getting back to that idea of it all has to still be a story, you know, if you're, it just depends on the pace and, and, the, and the tone and, and, the, and the, um, the audience you're, you're going for. So if you're, you know, if you're doing 18 stories a day, they still have to be, they still have to make people look. They still have to give people what they came for. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's an interesting time in, in food media as a, mm -hmm. as a reader because you can go to a Grub Street, you can go to Savoir for different things, and you can go, you know, sometimes you, you're to a tasty table, I should probably plug them. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you go sometimes for, uh, if, you, if you need that recipe tonight, or you want, or sometimes you just want to know about the gossip side of it, even if you don't always want to know. And sometimes you want to, you want to uh, sink your teeth into a sort of longer, a longer read. And so there are all these different, uh, mm -hmm. it's a very fractured, interesting food media world right now. It is, and that's actually one of the things I've wanted to tell you. You hit upon, you know, how do all these different sites inhabit the same food space? What are we, what is the public going on uh, various sites for? Uh, each site seems to have uh, a specific strength or, or something specific that they're that they're communicating to to their audience or to their public. Um, how big is, um, let's say it's Savour, how many, uh, how much of your uh, uh, audience is coming to the website for recipes? Um, it's about a 50-50 split um, in terms of attention on the site that's paid to our recipe archive, which is like 7,000 recipes or so, um, versus people who are, who are participating in stories and, and non-recipe content. But a, there's also a, a sort of huge overlap. You know, the, the Venn diagram of those two groups has, has quite a large area in the middle. But we are really two sites in one. And mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, the same is the case for foodandwine.com or bonappetit.com or, or um, you know, food52.com, which is purely digital. Um, you know, you tell stories and you also provide recipes. And very frequently, those stories and recipes interact with each other originally. But when they enter the archive, uh, a recipe is timeless in a way that even the most timeless story is not timeless. You know, a, a, a recipe for, you know, roasted broccoli is 
going to be the same recipe for roasted broccoli in 10, 20, 30 years, and will continue to have just as much value to a reader in all of that time. So I mean, you want to talk about like a long tail value. That's what a recipe is. Um, so we're playing to two audiences simultaneously, and those two audiences are also actually the same audience. They just are of two minds. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a, mm -hmm. a very sort of dissociative reader that we mm -hmm. have. Um, so. <laughs> uh, Hugh, one of the things um, that I'm wondering about at New York Magazine, uh, you know, you, you, one, we were talking about this uh, last night, uh, Helen and I were, and, and it's about the sort of the endurance or non-endurance of food criticism, of, of food reviewing. And, and the, you know, you, you have, I think people go to New York Magazine, um, I mean, you, I know I do, to read the movie reviews, to read you know, a lot of other things as well, but also uh, it has a, a certain sense of authority. Um, but now that we have Yelp and we have all these other, what do you think the, um, the future is for all three of you? This is really a question for all three of you, but because um, New York Magazine tends to do this much more, uh, the, the future of, uh, of food reviewing, food criticism. Um, I mean, we're very lucky at Grub Street because we get to run the content from the magazine's uh, reviewers, um, specifically Adam Platt and Rob Patronite and Robin Raisfield. Mm -hmm. um, they're producing all kinds of reviews, uh, you know, it, that people really want to read. And I, I think with the advent of Yelp and, and like social networks where people review things and you know give their opinion, I, th I think one of the, the good things about a, a great restaurant review is when you can disagree with it violently. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, th like a lot of people who love Adam Platt love to disagree with him. Right. Um, and I think that's that's what draws people in. Whereas, I mean, I think that someday somebody's going to figure out how to make, like, you know, criticism. You know, I'm sure there there are schools for Yelpers out there, but like, like, if it's just a laundry list of complaints about a place, mm -hmm. then there's no comparison mm -hmm. between, you know, somebody on Yelp saying a restaurant is good, and then Adam Platt from the magazine saying the restaurant is good. Right, so there's still you feel some a sense of authority that still is meaningful. Yeah, I think the medium is 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 still really important. Yeah, um, the, what do you guys think? I think that I mean I think the authority comes so for certain people. The authority comes from the 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 publication. I mean, mm -hmm. it, you could right. put the worst Yelper in the world at may, just decide he's going to be the New York Times critic, and he would have some authority. He would, right. You know, until he could probably ruin the standing <laughs> of the paper, but he would you know, he, he would. Just the, just that that connection means something, but I think for for most of us, for for most publications, a review is only as uh, authoritative or as compelling as the writing is good, as the reasoning is good, as the as the writer's critical faculties are, mm -hmm. you know, put to good use. Um, I mean, I think it used to be that you would you would rely on uh, restaurant critics to sort of tell you what what is new, what's out there, right. what, and you don't need them for that anymore. There's mm -hmm. a million sites right. and right. there's a million, there are a million ways to sort of find out about stuff that's happening. So now they have to kind of um, justify their existence somehow, and they do that, I think, by having a coherent thinking and, and experience and, uh, and, and being good, you know, good writers in the same way a good film critic is telling mm -hmm. you something that, you know, that everyone can go see a movie, everyone can mm -hmm. you know, read a book, but we still trust critics for, for certain takes on things. Yeah, I think, you know, critics, it used to be the case that you would read a, a restaurant review to know what to order. Right. You know, at the end of the review, there'd be that little, you know, box, and it would say, get the chicken parmesan, right. skip the Brussels sprouts. And you don't need that anymore because you have Yelp and you have Foursquare. And, and so what the critic does is, is, and I think this is great. I think this is actually criticism refining itself to its, its highest purpose. What the, what the critic does is not tell you what to order. The critic tells you what this restaurant does or does not contribute to us as a society. I mean, this mm -hmm. is, it's actually quite huge. I mean, mm -hmm. what, what a good critic does now, which is what a good critic has always done, but what a good critic is now forced to do, is to create a sense of context for this restaurant, both geographically and temporally, and to construct a narrative over the course of many reviews that they write, you know, whether it's weekly or monthly or daily or, or for whatever platform they're writing for, 
to tell the story of food in this city at this moment. Mm -hmm. And that's great. That's heavy, beautiful stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that is not something you get from Yelp. It's not something you get from Foursquare. So Chow Hound has no, the things, no, no. They like just they serve different purposes. They they provide you with information, and yeah. the critic provides you with the lofty philosophical spine for your entire eating experience. So all that opinionating out there hasn't killed the critic. I mean, we think there's still a place in the world for the critic going forward. It's like enriched the form of criticism. Has enriched the form. I think. Yeah. I mean, at the same time there are slashed budgets, and it's much harder to be a critic because anonymity is increasingly difficult and expense accounts are being shrunken. And, but that's not about criticism, that's about the business of media. Right. Um, so I think there are definitely elements of this that are at odds right now. There's a tension between the lack of the expense account and the need for this person to opine profoundly about what it means to eat this food but it will resolve itself, and I'm really rooting for it to resolve itself yeah. for the it, good guys. It, it, exactly, it forces the critic to find a new purpose, to, to say something interesting, and, yeah. and so you can't just, it's not enough just to have a big expense account, which you probably don't have. It's not mm -hmm. enough to believe that you can put on a wig and funny glasses and not be known, which right. no one can get away with anymore. Right. Um, so you have to, and it's not enough just to believe that you're informed, like you said, informing people about what to, you know, to eat the chicken and not the, Broccoli. Um, so I think it, it. I think it's it's in transition right now, but mm -hmm. I think it will lead to some sort of yeah, a, a kind of a new way of a more interesting way of talking about food. I mean, I I love, I write about food. I love reading about food. I like to eat. Uh, Pete Wells, the Times critic, is a good friend of mine. But I told him like whenever I get to the part where he's actually talking about food, I just skip over it. It's just bore. It's always the most boring part. Uh -huh. And so what's nice about it is it's like not having to do the listings anyway. You know, it's like you can just go online to find the address now. They can kind of skip over a lot of the telling you the the nuts and bolts about the chicken and the broccoli. Well, the food itself, I think, is frequently the least interesting part of any story about food. Well, the the writing about the, the food. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, like this the tastes piquant. Yeah. Like, yeah, okay, yeah. what does that mean? But like, you know, the woman standing in the kitchen and the sun coming over her shoulders and the way this reminds me of whatever. I mean, that's like, yeah. that's writing. That's um, okay, I wanna make sure that I leave plenty of time for people to ask questions and it's already, I know some, some students have to have uh, a class to go to a little bit and just a little bit and so yeah, I haven't left an, an, a lot of time. Yeah, there are night classes, I know. It's, it's, it's not fair, there's also 8 a.m. classes. Oh. Yeah, I know. And we live in Syracuse where there's snow and it's cold and it's eight in the morning and it's just gruesome. Um, okay, but uh, before I get to the question and answers, I, I did wanna have just a little bit of, Sort of, uh, I wanted to ask a couple of other basic things, or, or fun things actually, and that is trends in food. Um, is the kale thing over yet? I mean, where, when are we gonna wake up from kale? You know, are we? Kale is, it, kale is our new god, we should back Well, uh, okay, I'll Doesn't take your word for it. A, I've about had it up to here with the kale, Caesar <laughs> salad and the kale. Yeah. You know, Big green juice. You know? Um, so, so we think kale's here to, it's still, it's still in it, having its it moment? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. All right, but well, how great yeah. is it that kale is having a moment? Well, the because I'd rather have cauliflower. Food. That's why. I'm, no, the, I I'm, the I'm, trendiest you know. food is a vegetable. Yeah. Like the thing yeah. that surpassed bacon yeah. was a vegetable I that's hear, high in vitamin yeah. K. Like what is happening? That's amazing. I think it's great. I, I hear what you're saying. I, I just prefer a different vegetable. I'm tired of kale. Um, okay. So uh, I want to ask you about um, iconic foods. In your travels or in your hometown or anything, is there a particular iconic food that you absolutely love that when you go there you have to have that you say, you know, whether it's in Boston, it's chowder, or in Philly, it's a cheesesteak or whatever. Is there something that you yourself absolutely, it's, it's a sense memory and you love it and you're drawn to it. Hugh, why don't you, do you have one? Fried, fried clam bellies. Fried clam bellies. Yeah. And is there a, a place associated? Uh, no, they're all closed actually. Okay. Uh, so I have to do it myself, um, but I grew up working in clam bars. And so it's, the, where did you grow up? Uh, the South Shore of Long Island. Ah, okay. So there is a little bit of place hap happening there. Yeah, totally. Helen? Um, I grew up in Chicago, and um, for me, the Chicago food that I try to have whenever I'm there is um, this kind of disgusting yet incredibly wonderful thing. Um, there's a very specific genre of restaurant in Chicago that's just like a Chicago sub shop and mm -hmm. they are completely sui generis and 
weird and wonderful. And, and um, at many of them, you can get, they're basically short order greasy spoon counters. And um, you can get a burger, like a griddled, super greasy, totally gross, amazing burger, topped with gyro meat. Mm -hmm. And then like cheese whiz. <laughs> and, Has it got a name? Is there a name? <laughs> is there a name for this? Um, a, well, it, you, depending like, on what neighborhood in? you're in, it's either a gyro burger, a gyro burger, or a uh -huh. hero burger. But basically, that's a linguistic convention. Oh, that's funny. Um, that's it's really good. Yeah. That does not sound. Good. How can it not be? Yeah, it's really good. I, mean, you I got, probably you know. have gout. Uh huh. So when you go back to Chicago, is that what you? That's what you get. It's what my dad and I get. It's you know, it, that's the thing though is that I do it with my dad. Like yeah. it's not the burger. It's having the burger with my dad. Yeah. It's, yeah. Adam, have you got a? I I I don't know. No, this sounds like a cop out uh, and, a, and a fake answer. But the, I spent the last ten years just traveling to exhaustion, and so I, when I get home, I don't eat anything, and so I always get I get excited about the next place I'm going and eating. Eating something that is particular to a place is one of the key ways, one of the only ways for me to feel like I've been there. So I really like to, I mean, when I go to Chicago, I'll have to try that. Or, mm -hmm. But you know, I, I like when you land somewhere, just finding those, those iconic right. things. So it doesn't, I don't have any uh, super personal connection to any one of them, but I just get excited about trying yeah. them. Where did you grow up? Uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, there's no good food there. So there wasn't. <laughs> there wasn't. Really? There's nothing there that when you go back to Louisville. No, there is now. Have yeah, there, there is now. Sorry. What is it? The best food that it's one of the. the there's a lot of good food. Yeah, it got much better the day I left. I don't know. <laughs> is that yeah, right? You know, Kentucky's got some great barbecue. Yeah. Um, um, for barbecue. Um, burgoo. Ooh, huh? Yeah. Oh, burgoo, yeah. yeah. Something to do with all those squirrels you have in your freezer. Yeah. <laughs> Make a nice burgoo. Did you grow up eating burgoo? No. no. <laughs> Jews don't eat squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I think we're going to do uh, some QA. Uh, and if you want to tweet, I think we're going to run a, uh, a Twitter feed. So why don't we um, go ahead and, uh, but you can also ask some questions as well. So. Um, why, who's going to ask a question? That's what, you know, okay, we've got, I can't see everybody very well because of the light, so if I don't call your name and I know you, don't feel weird, but I think it's Diana up there. Is that right? Okay. Diana? I want to know what your favorite restaurant in New York is. Ah. Favorite restaurant in New York. Uh, I, that, you're supposed to say it's impossible to choose one. It's impossible to choose one. There are a few favorites. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I just finally went to Blanca, which is this weird, have you, yeah, it's, I mean, this is kind of a jerky answer because it has 12 seats and you can't get in and it's very expensive, but it was really, really wonderful. And it's, it's this weird little spaceship thing in the back of an old uh, garage out back of uh, Roberta's Pizza in Bushwick, which is like built in a converted uh, shipping container. And it's this very like hipster uh, place, but, but, but Blanca is genuinely like an amazing, amazing restaurant. Um, I, I think like a lot of people who eat professionally, when I'm on my own time, I like to go back to the same things over and over again. And in the last 14 weeks, I have been to Lafayette, which is a relatively new French bistro, like 22 times. What? Um, according wow. to my Foursquare. Wow. <laughs> wow. Don't, times. don't blame the gout on that. No. <laughs> well, I get the, I get the new sauce sandwich. salad, but, um... So that's my favorite restaurant right now, um, but it always moves around. I think one of the coolest restaurants in New York right now, one of, the, one of the ones doing the most interesting things, is this very tiny vegetarian restaurant on Ninth Street in the East Village called Dirt Candy. Mm. Um, it is not a hippie vegetarian restaurant. It's a very creative, very unhealthy, again, with the gout, um, vegetarian restaurant where the chef, Amanda Cohen, is just like this complete mad genius, and she does incredible things with vegetables. She is an absolute wizard. And the stuff that's happening there, I think, is unlike anything else happening at any other restaurant in the city. Hmm. Um, have you got one, Hugh? I don't, I don't really have a favorite restaurant, but I think there's, there's, one, there's a restaurant called Calliope in the East Village um, that I think if, you know, six nights out of seven, if you asked me if I wanted to go someplace to dinner, I'd suggest that place. Which is interesting, because it is, in some ways, a very, I don't mean, it's not safe, but it's a very easy to like, 
Yeah. Straight, straight well, what do you do? What kind of food? It's straight up French bistro French food. Basically. It's not bad. A little yeah. like. Well, that's more expensive. That's what we want to eat. More yeah. You're right. <laughs> so French bistro food, you say? Yeah, a little. I mean, I think to say French working class would be a little bit weird, but like it's, you know, things that, mm -hmm. you know, like your mechanic French grandfather <laughs> or something. It's what you want to eat French in France. Working class, I can so. never yeah. find. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. another question. Um, this guy here with the glasses and the black hair. I actually have. No, of course. You're the only dude here. So. <laughs> um, what, uh, building off the uh, Andrew Carmelini restaurant, which one is your favorite? Of his? Of his, oh. and then for all of you. And then um, I know that, or, or just you. Like, we can ask about Like three you questions. You answer that. Um, and then I know that um, a lot of uh, reviewers are, they, like the restaurants have been the bases in the back and all the servers know everyone. And um, Daniel Boulud's restaurant, Daniel got downgraded to three stars because he had a decoy. Do you think that's the new way to review restaurants? I, well, I think it's interesting that you mentioned that. I, does everyone know the story that uh, Pete Wells went, reviewed yeah. Daniel, and then he had a colleague of his uh, who was also in the dining room sort of eating as like a, a normal person would, would eat. And it's sort of a, uh, they had different experiences. They had very different, vastly different experiences. And they were there at the same exact yeah. right. Yeah. And they were treated differently. And it's sort of a, a, a tribute, in a way, to the famous Ruth Reichel review of Le Cirque years and years and years ago when she went in uh, costume and they didn't know who she was. And then one time she went and they knew who she was and they basically like pushed away the king of Spain or something and got her table. And she wrote two different reviews. And one was you know, Ruth Reichel, the known entity and one was the, the anonymous one. I think I'm getting this from right. Ohio. Yeah. This, yeah. She was and they were radically different experiences. Right. But I, I don't think it's fair to say it got downgraded because of that, because it was equal. I think that was an interesting way to tell that story. Um, I think one of the nice things about Danielle is that you, you, you feel like you're the food critic of a major newspaper, even if you're you know, a bumpkin from Boise or something. Um, so the, I, don't think it's a new, I don't think it's a new way to, to review restaurants because I don't think you could do that. I mean, there's not a budget for one reviewer, let alone two reviewers going several times. And I think that was just a, a particular sort of way in. Uh, I, I, and it, about the Carmelini restaurants, that, I don't know. Mm -hmm. but, no, I think I like, I guess I like Lafayette the best. Maybe the Dutch. I think my favorite's actually La Conda, but I can never get in. Uh, and I don't like to call in, you know. <laughs> it's a, well, speaking of special treatment, I mean, I think um, one of the reasons I go to Lafayette so frequently is because you can just walk in. It's a huge restaurant. And right. especially when the weather was nice, they also have a huge outdoor space. So you could walk up and sit down immediately. And in New and York, that's a luxury. Times, they, know you. they do know me by now. Um, <laughs> But they don't know me because I'm an editor at Subvert. They know me because I go there all the time, and that is fantastic. It feels really, really nice. Um, the criticism thing, I think anonymity is really important, but it is not the only important vector. Um, it's very hard to maintain your anonymity. Um, it's very hard to know when you're 17 years old that when you're 45, you're going to be the critic for the New York Times, so you better not set up a Facebook account. You know, I mean, this is, it's, it's, it's not going to work. So I think the decoy is a way to do it, but it really was a gimmick. Um, I don't know what's going to wind up happening. I think you know there are a lot of critics writing now who are not anonymous at all. The critic for the New York Observer, Joshua David Stein, who I think is doing very interesting things with criticism right now, is basically the opposite of anonymous. You guys going to have to explain why you left. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because he's he's like you know Instagram like a selfie of himself shirtless. He's very ripped. He's very ripped. He 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 bikes. <laughs> Likes a lot. Yeah. Boxes. He's like he's a yeah. good looking guy. He's very athletic. Yeah. yeah. But you know, he's totally not anonymous, but um but I also think, you know, what Adam was saying, like the the role of the critic is not really to talk about the food anymore, like qua the food. Like you could show up and they could know exactly who you are and you know, I'm sure there are plenty of restaurants in the city that have all three of our names on lists and we're not critics. And um you know the, the critic can talk about what story this restaurant is trying to tell and whether it's succeeding or failing at telling that story, whether or not they get insane VVVIP service. And also, for the record, when you do get insane VVVIP service, you know. Right. Like, you know when that's happening. If you're not sure if you've had it or not, you have not had it. There's also, there, there are only a handful of restaurants that can really change the experience 
based on someone walking in. And it's not like they've, every restaurant has, you know, a better cut of meat in the fridge or a, or a smarter you... waiter or better a better wine list or a more, you know, coherent menu that they can just swap out or better music or better design. There's just, I, I just, I think anonymity is an interesting sort of historical kind of thing that a way to, to, to uh, write as objectively about something that you can't be objective about. But I don't think it's the, as important as, as a lot of people think. Another right. question. Sorry. Oh, oh. sorry. oh I'm sorry. You, you were gonna I was just going to say, um, just quickly, like, um, I, I agree that the, with the Daniel review, the, the, the device of having the decoy, there's just a device that's just a way to frame the review. And um, I just wanted to add that. Because I've, I've worked in, in kitchens that were four-star New York Times restaurants. And um, I didn't work at Per Se, but when Per Se opened, like legendarily, Thomas Keller had an extra chef de cuisine come in like for like the first six months when they were expecting their critics when they're in the critic cycle. Um, and they did have separate mise en place. They did have separate like, you know, pieces of fish. Like, and that stuff, you know, like, at the end of service, like you know, when they when they were sure that no critic had come in, they like that person would just, you know, go home. Um, and so like these, but examples like that in Danielle, they're just, they're just you know, there there are very few restaurants yeah, like that. So the the potential for that becoming like a a thing for reviews in general is just not likely. Okay, another question. Let's see, um, the uh, young woman right here, uh, yeah. Hi. Um, <clears throat> in the Miami Herald, about 15 years ago, uh, they decided, the food writers decided that, or the lawyer decided that uh, when there was a zero star or an F, that it was not going to be published um, because of what it did to the food community, the chefs, and everything. To this day, the Miami Herald does not publish an F or a zero star. Um, I kind of wanted to hear your take on that because New York City is, I mean, and food writing in New York City is um, We, um, up, until, up until recent, my, my partner uh, was a restaurant critic for The Village Voice. Um, and, uh, but we had the opportunity to, to go out to dinner at a restaurant with Pete Wells, the New York Times critic, recently. And the food was so bad at this place that it should have been good, that I think, and I don't know if you've had. What was the name? The... <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, I think he was just sort of, you know, he, for 15 minutes after we left the restaurant, he was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And, you know, so far, thus far, I don't, I think maybe he's returned, but I, he hasn't published, he hasn't reviewed the restaurant. All right, well, I think we've come pretty much to the end of the evening, and I want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, really appreciate it, and thank the three of you very much for, for a terrific conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.